Come on, everybody. Here we go. Monitor circuits continue to detect a decrease in production activities in Droid Sector 2. Shutdown procedures will begin in 60 seconds unless output increases immediately. Hey, Captain, I'll say yes. I'll get you for this pan if it's the last thing oh, I do. Don't just sit there, you fool. Oh, gee, oh, gee. I'm coming, Captain. <laughs> Hello, hi there. Welcome to my park. How you doing? Uh, Hello. Whoa, 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 whoa. What? You are not Mickey Mouse. You are a rat. Rat schmat. Besides, they're tourists. What do they know? Will you get out of here? Okay, but do I still get my ten bucks? No, Come on, everybody. Here we go. W, w Radio, your information station. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the WDW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I'm your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 146 for the week of November 22nd, 2009. Thank you for tuning in once again. Disney enthusiasts who enjoy the parks and films often look for other ways to continue the experiences as much and as often as possible. They look for ways to continue the stories beyond what they've already seen or heard, and in some cases, they're fortunate enough to have the characters and storylines go beyond the confines of the original, as is the case with what my next guests this week have created. They are Dave Barry and Ridley Pearson, best-selling authors of the Peter and the Starcatchers series of books, which recount the tales of Peter Pan, Tinkerbell, and Captain Hook in the days before the original novel and animated film. I had a chance to sit down with them in Walt Disney World and get a close look inside the collaborative efforts these two creative talents brought together to chronicle the adventures of Peter Pan before he lost his shadow. With Thanksgiving just around the corner, I wanted to look at how and why you and your family might want to think about spending this traditional holiday in possibly a non-traditional place, Walt Disney World. We'll look at where you can spend your Thanksgiving dinner with family and friends, places to stay, and why now is a great time to visit the resort. I'll play more of your voicemails at the end of the show, so sit back Relax and enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. But Peter, how do we get to Neverland? Fly, of course. Fly? It's easy. Now you try. I'll think of a mermaid lagoon. <sighs> Underneath a magic moon. Oh, I'm in a pirate's game. I think now I'll be in a parade. Now, everybody try. One, two, three. three. We can fly, we can fly, we can fly. Sometimes, while we're enjoying some of our favorite Disney films or animated movies, we, or even our children, sometimes step out of that suspended disbelief and we may ask ourselves, or maybe have that question asked to us, something like, yeah, but how did Peter Pan and Captain Hook meet for the very first time? And sometimes that simple question might be the catalyst to a whole new adventure. And the, in the case of my next guests, that's very much the case. They are best-selling authors, Dave Barry and Ridley Pearson, who took that question, joined literary forces, as it were, and now are celebrating the fourth in their series of a new adventure of Peter Pan in the Peter and the Starcatcher series. So uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you both to the show. Thanks, Ray It's our, our fourth in our trilogy, as we've been saying. <laughs> Math is not our strong suit. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's the thing. It's, this book series has grown from that little girl's question to 
you know, the fourth in the trilogy. Tell us about that story, because that really is how it started. Yeah, I was uh, reading to my then five-year-old daughter, and J.M. Barry, who wrote the classic Peter Pan, wrote a play, and then a short story, and then a novella. And we were reading the novella, like a hundred-page story. We were six or seven pages into it, and she covered up the book and said, Hey, Dad, how did Peter meet Captain Hook in the first place? So but when you get that first question, you know, and as a parent, too, I get those questions, too, that you look and you say, Well, now how do I answer it? What do you tell her? What do you answer? How do you answer your five-year-old? Well, I mean, at that moment, I literally said, uh, her name is Paige. And I said, Paige, that's its own story. And then I said, No, 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 that's its own book. And then I left her to try to read it by herself, and I took off and she's started making it She hasn't learned to read yet, because Ridley Daddy? just left her. No. But she's much older now. <laughs> so, obviously, that's the catalyst to the Peter and the Star Catcher series. Tell us how, obviously, that's how the book idea came. How do you two start collaborating on this? Well, we, uh, we, we, <laughs> we had been friends for years. We were in a band uh, called the Rock Bottom Remainders. Which is the, the premise of the band was wouldn't it be great if a bunch of authors with musical talent got together and raised money for charity? And the, the flaw in that plan was that none of the authors turned out to have any musical talent, but we got together. And, and it's a, it's, the band has some real literary talent Stephen King, uh, Mitch Album, Amy Tan, uh, Roy Blunt Jr., Scott Toro, Greg Isles. Uh, so the, 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 write, the writing's pretty good, the, the playing, not so good, the music part. But Ridley and I have been in the band since the start, 1992. And have become close friends. Our families have become close friends. And um, it was at least 10 years. It was, no, it's like 12 years that we'd known each other. When he came down, the band was playing in Miami, where I live. Really was staying in my house. And one morning at breakfast, he said, Paige had this idea. And it literally, it was a week after Paige had asked me. And I'd been mulling over this thing. Maybe there's a prequel to Peter Pan. And Dave just happened over coffee. He said, so what are, you, what are you doing? What are you working on? You know, kind of a, one of those toss-away questions. I said, you know, I'm thinking about writing a prequel to Peter Pan. And his eyes went, what? You know? And, and here little, we are. Little did we know. I mean, e- even then, I mean, when we wrote the first one, when we wrote Peter and Starcatchers, first of all, when we started it, we did not imagine it being that long. It ended up being over 500 pages. We certainly didn't imagine writing a second, third, and now fourth book in this series. And... and um, it's just changed. I mean, it really has changed my life, literally. I, I still write humor, uh, but we've, we've traveled all over the country and into other countries talking about these books. And we've met all these kids. We've, we've gotten involved with Disney, which has turned out to be just wonderful for both of us. Um, we have little red magic passes that get us and our families into the parks for free, among other things. So we, we've just, and we've had an incredible time, you know. Yeah, we discovered this world of writing for kids. And it's just, you know, when you do book events, we did one last night in St. Louis. And when you do a book event, it's so different than, than an adult event. You get the wildest question. The kids are so into the story. They're so into the characters. They know more about the books than you ever could know, even though you wrote them. <laughs> yeah, we mentioned last night we were thinking about doing a fifth book, and, which we, in this book tour, sort of been batting around an idea for a fifth book, and we, we talked about what it might be about. And this one little boy immediately came up to us immediately as we finished. He rushed up, his dad behind him, saying, no, no, don't bother them yet. They have to go sign book. And he said, I know how you could do it. And he tells us one way we could do it. <laughs> and then, then we go back to do the signing. An hour and a half later, the same kid shows up. He's in line for an hour and a half. I know another way you could do it. <laughs> it's like, it's just, they're like that. And, and adult fans, they, they, they like your work and everything. They kind of let you do the writing. <laughs> and kids don't. They take ownership of the story. And they, they inhabit the world, you know, they come dressed in character. They want and they, they view us not so much as the artists or the auteurs as the portal for them to this world that they like and they want to know more about. And they, they want to drill way down in they drill farther down than we would drill. So they have questions that we've never even considered. You know, Dave was asked one night, we have porpoises that can communicate with the people in the books. Really, it's really had to speak porpoise. Yeah, really. I'll so, give you a little example. Yeah. <laughs> Which is hello, Lou. You look a little odd today. Um, but, or I have mailed my teeth to Italy. It could be either. There's really, there's really no way to know what he says in Porpoise. He just tells us. What it's he no does. fun working with this guy. I don't even remember what I was going to say. So there. Oh, I know. They, they asked Dave how old the Porpoise is in our book. Well, you know, they, they've read it so many times. Now that's something they really need to know. We've never even thought about it. Yeah. You know, connecting to aspects of the book that you might have just glossed. And, but that's how the thing. So. Both of you, obviously, you know, your literary careers are, are very well known. How do you make that transition, writing for adults, to now writing for, as you've come to discover, those kids that look at the books very differently? Fortunately, when we started, we were way too stupid 
to ask that question. Um, and, you know, it turns out that the world of young adult fiction is a very serious world, and it's quite distinct. You know, I, if I were to lay the, the simplest gloss I could put on it is, generally those of us who have been writing for adults think of it as a job, and we love it, it's a great job, it's fun, and it involves creativity. We think, you know, you know this is what we do because we like to do it and people like us to do it. There are, there's this huge element of the people writing for children's world that think of it as a kind of a mission. And, you know, the mission is to educate and to deal with issues and to this and that. Not that we have any problem with that, but we weren't thinking that way. We were thinking like, hey, we got this would be a great way that Peter Pan could fly, you know, <laughs> which is essentially we think how the kids think about it. So when we wrote the story, I mean, obviously the theme is what you would think of as for younger people. But it, the only real difference between it and the way we write adult fiction is, you know, there's, there's obviously no, you know, the violence is subdued. There's no, there's no sex at all. And it's, you know, no it's kids, you know, it's, ki- it's for kids. It's something you would want your own kids to read. But the story, we just, I mean, we absolutely plotted it the way we would plot and I'll, you know, want stuff to keep happening, action. Um, we want we to have a really sad, you know, a kicker of an ending. We, wanted, and that's, we, we, didn't, we didn't change any language in the sense of, you know, writing down we wrote what the, you know whatever word I'd have picked to write that that plot sequence in an adult book is the same one I would you know it's just yeah. I was writing about mermaids and Peter Pan. That was a decision we made together. I mean, we sat down and said, should we try to write down and do other? We both said, no way. You know, we're going to write a story that we'd like to read to our kids or we'd like to read ourselves, and the kids will get it, and they do. That's the thing, kids. Yeah, get I, it. And, I, and I think that translates too because I think that's why the books have become popular not just with kids but yeah. with adults as well. Yeah, well, there's a statistic you've been citing. Yeah, well, Disney tells us that that at least half of our sales are to adults. Um, they've been tracking it, and so you know, and it's the sales are in huge numbers. So it just shows there's an awfully big adult population reading the books, which now, is great. Some you know, of these really adults are dressed as Tinkerbell. Oh, that's true. I should point that out. That. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah. there's, a, there's a story there. I can yeah. tell. Oh, yeah. Well, the first time when we signed for, uh, the first book, Peter and Starcatchers, in New York City, uh, we didn't know really what kind of crowd we were going to get. We got a good crowd, uh, which, which we were very pleased to see, you know, because this is a brand new thing for us. But one of them was this woman, attractive woman in her mid forties, dressed as Tinkerbell, completely dressed as Tinkerbell, who, who came with her family on the subway, and, and her daughters were quite embarrassed. Rings. Her, her husband said, and he still says, I always carry the camera, and that way I can't be in any of the picture. <laughs> but, but then, but she's this lovely lady who just happens to like the dress as Tinkerbell. She gets, you know, gets a thrill from it. She loves the book. And we found there are more of those people out there than we knew. You know? And she showed up at other oh, yeah, signings. Every she signing showed up done. at a signing outside of Philadelphia two weeks ago. Yeah. I believe it because the, the Disney enthusiasts are very, very passionate. I think you see it with Kingdom Keepers, the oh, same thing as well. Oh. It's, it's listed as a book for young children, I will tell you, being one of them, adults love the books as well. Certainly holds true with Peter and the Starcatchers. Right. I think so, too. And it's, it's so fun for us because that's how we write them. I mean, we're, we're, we're writing them as adults, for adults and for kids, and hopefully everybody enjoys it. And let's talk about the process itself because, again, you've written books individually. What about the collaborative effort? Is it easier? Is it tougher? And how do you actually go? Because I'm sure your writing styles may be different. You know, for one... You know, it might take 10 years to write the great American novel. Others might have those flashes of genius. How does that process happen? Fortunately, neither one of us has those flashes no. of genius, so we don't have to, we don't have to deal with that issue. Now, we, have a, we have a system that's a pretty logical system. Um, we out, this is Ridley's idea. We should outline the books first. If you can imagine, he believes it's important to know what the book's going to say before you start writing it. And um, so we do. We, we outline, which is uh, probably the hardest part of the process and, and requires, in a way, the most intense thought. Um, just because the plots tend to be complicated. We have lots of balls in the air. If you have a lot of action, you need a lot of things going on. And when they have to make some sense. And, and then we divide the books by character so that you don't see the... Ch- you know, we don't do odds and evens or something. We, Dave takes the light, humorous, childlike characters. I take the piratical, psychopathic And, and he does characters. the porpoises also. And the porpoises. Um, and anything that's left over. And we write a draft of that chapter following the outline the other guy edits it however he wants rewrites it does whatever he wants sometimes I don't get back a word I did sometimes I get back a few words changed same with Dave and we keep going on that process and it goes we're doing this in two different cities yeah. I'm in Miami he's in St. Louis so, so it's all by email you know we almost never once we've done the outline talk about these things yeah. that was my next question do you actually get on the phone and, and talk about it because you obviously you have the outline but you've got to make sure not only that you're plotting the same course and going in the same direction but and something that had to be very important from the very beginning, keeping the integrity of the characters consistent through the way through. That's and why we each pick, pick a section of characters. That way the characters stay solid. And that's what's important in a book. 
you fall in love with the characters, you live and breathe with the characters. You can't have them as schizophrenic as we are. Plus, we, we sort of know them now. You know, you, I mean, we know how our Captain Hook is going to talk and react and how our Smee is and how our Peter Pan is. Um, I don't know if it's the same as, ever, you know, what J.M. Uh, it's obviously not the same as what J.M. Barry would do, but it, the way we write them, we both know, you know, what they would and wouldn't do. And, and you know, a character like Tink, which is Dave, um, I, every time I get a chapter with Tink in it, I want to read ahead and see the Tink stuff because I love how sassy Tink is. And that's the thing, too, because the 1953 Disney animated film, which I think most people are, are most familiar with, is very different than the original J.M. Barry. So how do you, going forward, resolve some of those inherent conflicts? Again, we were too stupid uh, to worry <laughs> didn't about. didn't even bother reading the book. He just about <laughs> these issues. No, we, did. I, we both read the book. And, and we both watched the, um, the cartoon, the Disney classic animated feature again. And we, I think we both reached the same conclusion, which is we're not going to try, to, we're certainly not going to try to write anything like what Jan Barry wrote, which is a, a very surreal and dark and I think uh, basically unfamiliar to most Americans. Um, so we, we weren't even going to, we weren't going to use that as a touchstone. We definitely were going to use the, the Disney animated feature as a touchstone, but only as a touchstone. And that is to say... In our minds, and, 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 I, and it's, we haven't formally surveyed people, but this is sort of the reaction we get. Most people know the characters from there. What they, they, their image of what Peter Pan looks like comes from that, or from visiting Disney World. Their image of, of what happened pretty much comes from that. That sort of streamlining and logic induced, you know, the, what are, I'm going to say, logic rationalization of the story the way the Disney animators did. Um, and we, so we want to use that sort of as a touchstone. We're going to like. Be that, let that be the end point of our story but we're not going to get all hung up on making it you know, note for note scene for scene line up with that we really wanted to create you know, our own world and I think it's kind of like a, a giant elaborate fanzine we're writing a one possible way you could do that somebody else could come along and I'd, I'd like to see somebody actually come along and write a whole other way to get to Peter Pan you know, it'd be fine with us you know, another world but this is the one we've got and the one time we did go almost beat for beat, Disney, um, I don't know if you've dealt with this in your podcast, but Disney revived the illustrations of Mary Blair, which were used by Walt Disney as templates for the early wonderful um, animated films he did, including Peter Pan. And we were honored that Disney came to us and asked us to retell the animated version of the film through Mary Blair's artwork. So the one time we did go... Literally, you know, I mean, I, I dissected that animated film frame by frame so that we knew what we had and what we didn't have. Um, and it's nothing like what we did, of course, in, the, in our books or any of that. So we've had that experience. That book is just out, which is a beautiful book. But, um, we, you know, to go back and see it again five years into this process was really revealing for me to sort of see all the little, you know, well, yeah. Tiger Lily and all this stuff yeah. that we're not even going toward. Yeah, you know? I, I, I went back and watched it just recently, the cartoon. And um, and I realized we have we have radically altered certain things on that island. You know, our our natives are nothing like the Disney natives. You know, which are kind of parody, 1950s stereotype Indians. You know, that you wouldn't want to ever try to do them today. Which I think one of the reasons that that feature is not seen the way it used to be seen. Um, and you know, so I don't know whether it was good or bad. But we, you know, I, I realized well, we, we've really we've picked our own way of looking at it. And it's quite different. And I think it works well because you've got the collaborative, you've got the thriller writer and the humorist. You each bring something a little bit different to the story, and you play on the J.M. Barry characters and well, the Disney characters. People can't see this on the radio, but and I'm one of I'm really good looking, and Ridley's not. So like, there's a balance all the way through. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Lou? Um, so I'm going to move move forward. Um, so you talked about you had this singular idea that came from the question. And now you have the fourth in the trilogy, The Sword of Mercy. Well, we can walk you through that. Yeah, I was going to say, ask, walk we, you through we, the process. We did Peter and the Star Characters. We thought that was the only book we were doing like this. And uh, we had a great time doing it. Disney thought, you know, maybe there's other books there. And we talked about where do you... We had gotten the first book up to the creation of Tinkerbell. I remember we had this conversation. We yeah. were at the BEA, and we had written the Star Characters. hadn't come out yet. BEA is the booksellers at uh, big convention. It was in Chicago that year. And... Um, we, Star Catchers hadn't come out yet, but they, Disney was really liking it. And they were sitting, they had, they set us down for cocktails, the, all the, oh, the all the big wigs, and they said, "We really would like you to try, you know, to 
to do a couple more. And I remember saying, really, I don't know. I really don't think there's any more here. I don't know. You know, we don't know it's going to do okay or whatever. I was very negative about it. And I, I, I said, negative. what about the shadows? Because I've always been, you know, um, intrigued by his ability to disconnect from his shadow, leave it behind, all of that. And I, I said, what about the shadows? And Dave said, that's a two-sentence book. <laughs> but it Two out, full books, yeah, basically. Was, <laughs> basically 600 pages. So, you know, it worked out. But each one has led to the next. Then we got done with the trilogy, which they made as a box set. We were completely done. And it really was two things. We, we never stopped hearing from kids. I mean, they were relentless about, you know, when are, when's, the next, when's the next one coming? And it wasn't like a, a really even a, a you know a question. It was so much sort of a demand. Of course, there's going to be another one because this is what we do now. We read these books. Um, so that was one thing. But then we really didn't. Didn't you know? We didn't want it to just let's feel like we were doing it. Just we had to do another one, and then we had this idea um, that involved the, uh, well, the sword of mercy, which is a real sword. It's what part of the crown jewels, and it's this, this very unusual crown jewel. And then it's a broken sword. The tip is missing, and it nobody knows where it came from. Really, it's said to have been Charlemagne's sword at one time, but there's a legend about where it came from. A legend about how it lost the tip. A lot of legends around the sword. A lot of, and. And so we started doing a little research, and, and, and it turned out in 1901, which would have been 23 years, we decided after the last book, there, the Queen Victoria had died after 60-some years as regent, and her son was going to take over, which meant there had to be a coronation, which meant they have to bring out the crown jewels. And we thought, well, what if that event had significance beyond the coronation? What if the bad guys were still around and they could use this coronation somehow. What, how, what if they had actually somehow managed to infiltrate the royal family? And The sword was a huge key for something. And what yeah. if, you know, what if, you know, Molly's grown up now and she's got a little girl named Wendy but she hasn't told her anything. And it just, the more we talked about that, the more we thought, what a cool yeah. story that is. You know? <laughs> and then Peter's back on the island, he's sort of forgotten all about them or he thinks they've forgotten all about him but they haven't. And, and what would happen if Captain Hook, you know, set out now and suddenly it's in the 20th century and there's steamships out there and he's out there trying to be a pirate and we just started thinking about all the scenes and that's we couldn't then we knew we had to do it yeah it was it was a fun process do you find that it's becoming more of a challenge as you move forward with new books in the series or do you find that it's easier because you've got sort of the, the cornerstones already laid for the characters and how you're going to write it and now it's easy to tell the stories you want to tell i think it's 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 harder to think of a story that you really think is worthy right uh, but once you do have that idea, it's easier because, we, we, as you say, we really have the world now. We have the characters. We feel they're ours. I mean, never, not to, in any way to, to diminish Jam Barry's incredible achievement, but this world that we've taught, you know, our fanzine version, those, that's our world now. And we really know it pretty well, and our fans know it really well. And we don't have to, you know, we don't have to explain as much as we used to. And there was a story that we were kicking around that's still out there um, that kind of intrigued me and lingered around we talked about it some but then this other story came and we may yet do another we each time we think it's over you know i think anyway <laughs> yeah. i think we both sort of say well that's that you know i think there's a lot of kids yeah there's a lot of kids who are going to probably disagree with you that it's over <laughs> yeah no apparently it's not over we've, we've concluded that yeah. it'll be over when they tell you it is <laughs> i have kids of my own i know yeah. um you know the book's obviously so very successful but almost separate from that the audio version of the book oh. has taken on a life of its own. Jim Dale, many of us know him as Doc Terminus from Pete's Dragon, brings a whole life. Tell us about the audio version of the book and maybe working, if at all, with Jim. When we discovered, you know, we knew him already from having to voice the American Harry Potter, Harry Potter, we thought, when they told us that he'd agreed to do our books, we were stunned and, I mean, we were thrilled. Uh, but then we had this amazing conference call with him, the very beginning. He said, you know, they said, Jim Dale wants to talk to you about... So we get on the phone, and there's that voice, you know, that... I've never met... I had not met him at that point. I don't know if... No, I didn't either. Anyway, we're talking to Jim Dale, and it's, it's like... like you're talking to Harry Potter. Or, <laughs> or, or like you're talking to God, you know? It's like it, this voice coming, you know, this... or Anyway... And, Hello, Dave. And, yeah. Yeah. and then he starts to say, well, now I've, I've been going through the, you know, the characters, and uh, I think Miss Bumrake, as I see her, and I just want to confirm with this... As I see her, she's from Yorkshire... And I'm not going to try to do his accents. 
But, and, but she's from Yorkshire, but she has aspirations to the upper middle class. So her voice, when she grew up, would have been like this. And, they just, and then some, it changes. Then he said, but now she's more tall. Because she's working now for the Astors, she's a little, a little higher. And it changes then, again. Yeah. And then, uh, and then she might, when she's getting mad at the children, shift into this. And, and it not, changes again. Yeah. <laughs> and that was Mrs. Brumbray. One character. <laughs> and he's got, you know, this evolution of how her voice from her childhood changed to adulthood. So then, you know, he goes through all that and he says, what would you think of that? And then I go... Jim, what, what is it you want from us again? <laughs> we had no. Why do you call us? Go down. Are you talking about the no, he t- and then now we've 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 had um, we've had the jo- great joy and honor of spending time with him, hanging out with him, uh, and he, above all, we do these readings when we when we tour the book, you know, real read a chapter, you know, and we put on pirate hats and it's a lot of fun. When we were in New York uh, this last trip, Jim read a chapter, and it's like it was. They're doing, they look at each other like, what are we? What color Why should love? we ever do this? <laughs> it was so brilliant. And, oh you know, you God. see the whole place, all the people just, you know, they're perfectly still. Nobody's breathing while he's talking. Yeah. You see this guy, and he's shifting. He's, you know, even though he does it on, you know, see, you don't see him do this when you listen to the books, obviously. But he changes when he's, when he's Captain Hook. He's, his stature is completely different than when he's Smee. Suddenly he turns into this little man. Little terrified man is, and he wrings his hands, you know, while he's talking. I don't even think he knows he's doing these things. I know he becomes that character. It was so much fun. Yeah, it's really, really fun. He and he's able to paint that picture. I mean, the book obviously does it so very well because of the detail. But he's able to do that just through the audio. Well, you know, it's. I hate to say this, but most audio treatments of books are great, but they aren't as good as the book, in my opinion. It's fun to have somebody read it to you. The embarrassing thing about this is Jim's adaptation, where he does all these 50 voices, it's way better than the book. <laughs> so we sit there going, oh my gosh, this is better than what we did. Yeah, you know? like we, a couple of chapters that, you know, we wrote them, so you'd think we would be really familiar with them. We hear them, we go, whoa, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. <laughs> Well, certainly, and again, because you're appealing to a younger audience, you know, the next logical step for many people as well, you've got the books and you've got the audio, certainly nothing would be better than a Peter and the Star Catchers film. That's a good idea. <laughs> Who's listening? <laughs> Dave likes that idea. Uh, we, we all like that idea. What, what Disney has done is they've, Disney Theatrical, who brought you Beauty and the Beast and uh, a million other things, um, it has developed it as a play with Rick Ellis writing it, who did Jersey Boys. And Dave and I have seen it, and it's spectacular. It's not a musical. They workshopped it in uh, La Jolla, California. They have a program called Page to Stage where they take... The audience knows it's watching a workshop, and it, they pay to come. And at the end of each performance, the audience stays and gives feedback. And then they read write scenes and real re- redo it radically for, for the next day. Yeah. Yeah. So for three weeks, they rewrote it every night. And it's just unbelievable. And they're trying, Disney Theatrical is trying to mount it on Broadway. But that's, of course, a tremendous investment, difficult thing, recession, all of that. So who knows? If it gets to Broadway, there was a lot of talk that once it was to Broadway, we might get three films out of it. So we'll see. Okay, so somebody from Disney comes to you and says, Dave Ridley, we're, we're going to make this into a movie. Who do you guys think should play Peter Pan? Me. <laughs> no. You are more handsome. So I, yeah, <laughs> That's on the record now a couple times. Uh, well, first of all, it would have to be a real kid. Um, I mean, if it's if it's live action. If it's live action. I was never yeah. a fan of. I mean, Mary Martin was. A, I loved her in South Pacific, but when I was a kid, um, I always thought it was wrong that they had a woman playing Peter Pan, and and I never did. I really never understood it. I never understood why they continued with Kathy Rigby. He's a boy, and you know, and we and we have in our our version of it, a, you know, really strong female character. Every, uh, so. I mean, there's plenty of room for girls to put well, that. Has to be and to me, the, it's actually just set up because the the perfect format, I think, is motion capture, like they've just done with uh, Christmas Carol. And Zemeckis has an ongoing contract to deliver several films a year to Disney, so it, it would seem to fit right into Zemeckis' palette. I have no um, idea what really he's talking about. Okay. <laughs> but I often don't when we have these conversations. But I want to say I agree with it. As long as he's still agreeing that I'm a better-looking person. <laughs> Well, each of the books in the series carries forward that same sense of adventure and fantasy and magic and mystery about Peter Pan and Captain Hook and all these characters, as well as the ones that you've introduced. And that's why they are not just wonderful for kids, but 
wonderful books for parents to read to kids at night. And as a parent, and as a somewhat of an adult, but with a, with a bit of a Peter Pan complex and never wants to grow up, they're wonderful reads for adults as well. So uh, I can tell you on behalf of everybody who's a Peter and the Star Catchers fan, we hope the series continues. Well, thanks so much. We appreciate that. Thanks, Lou. It's been a pleasure. So we all know about spending the Christmas and the winter holidays in Walt Disney World, the New Year's Eve special events, a romantic Valentine's Day with the one or ones that you love, other holidays like Super Bowl Sunday, Arbor Day, Easter, all the big holidays that you think of when you think of Walt Disney World. But today we want to look at maybe a holiday that you don't think about when you think about spending time in Walt Disney World, and that's going to be Thanksgiving. And uh, joining me today to look at some places and ways to celebrate Thanksgiving is a friend of the show and really a friend of mine as well, Sarah Moore from All Star Vacation Homes. Sarah, welcome. Thanks, Lou. Happy to be here with you today. Although Arbor Day is one of my favorites. Uh, I'm happy to talk about Thanksgiving with you today. (laughs) I thought it was just me. I'm huge. Arbor Day is huge at my house. But um, we're actually sitting here in downtown Disney just sort of enjoying Some of the things that people can enjoy that we'll talk about that you can do for and around the Thanksgiving season. Because I think, and the reason why I wanted to do this was, I think a lot of people don't think about coming to Walt Disney World for Thanksgiving. Because traditionally, this is a holiday that is all about spending time at home. But I think we're going to cover some of the different things that maybe you didn't think about and maybe a way to bring some of that tradition and that at-home experience to Walt Disney World. I think so. And Thanksgiving is also so much about bringing together those that you love. And that doesn't necessarily have to be in your home. That can be in a place that you love so much, a place that you love to travel and just bringing those you love together, especially if they're in different parts of the country. I agree. Uh, Home is where you make it. And I think Thanksgiving really is more about the tradition and the people that you spend it with and the eating and the football games than it is where you spend it. And, uh, I think you can actually make an argument, and we're going to to a certain point today, that, you know, while the cool air and the rustling leaves that I remember from back home in New Jersey and the whole Thanksgiving Day experience is nice, and it's wonderful, and it paints a great Norman Rockwell picture. However, being able to do that down here, and then the next morning, take a walk down Main Street, ride Pirates of the Caribbean, then at night, go in the pool, sounds like a very nice alternative as well. Absolutely. People ask, um, me personally as as friends from around the country, ask about the best time to visit Orlando or best time to visit Disney. And we always encourage the late fall. We always encourage November, Thanksgiving time, early December, because it's just, it's a very pretty time. Um, The crowds are less. Um, It's mid-season for most down here, so your costs are going to be less too. And it really is a wonderful time to be in the Orlando area. We can start with the, the simplest aspect of it. And the weather, and we're enjoying a beautiful, nice, cool day here in downtown Disney, sitting outside where it's not so uncomfortable and brutally hot, and that's why you're right. Fall is a very nice time of year to come, and because of the season, uh, when you talk about saving money, that's one of the things that we're going to look at as well, is if you're thinking about coming to Walt Disney World and you only have one time of year, this might be a great time to look at going. But really, I think we need to start with the most important part of any Walt Disney World experience and really Thanksgiving as a whole, and that's the dining. Because people say, well, I can't go down to Walt Disney World and have hamburgers and chicken nuggets and french fries. And again, that's when I, you know, shudder and cringe when I hear people talk about that because we all know there's so many great dining experiences here. And Walt Disney World does have special menus and places that you can dine specifically for Thanksgiving, And we'll talk about some of the different options as well. But I think for a lot of people, myself included, the first place that comes to mind, and really, if you talk about that, that traditional 
Thanksgiving to have it would be the Liberty Tree Tavern. It really looks like that 18th century colonial homes with the dark woods and and the vintage uh, props and, and story that comes with it. And it really does cover all the traditional aspects of Thanksgiving, including the Thanksgiving dinner with the turkey and the dressing and all the fixings. And, you know, look at it this way. Here's a way to convince your, your husband or your wife. Tell them it's a great historical learning experience for the kids because they'll learn about the history of Thanksgiving as well. Without a doubt. Um, <laughs> that's got to be a good way to convince anyone to come. It's all about the education, Lou. <laughs> the education, the food. Listen, you can see I've, I've made this argument before. The lawyer in me comes out. Money well spent for law school. Uh, and listen, you can have Thanksgiving dinner really any night over at Liberty Tree because that is what they serve, the traditional turkey and the pork. But if you want to have that traditional sort of family type meal, that's one of the first places for me that comes to mind. I'm going to throw out a couple of other options for you. And uh, because there, there's different ways that you can approach Thanksgiving dinner in Walt Disney World, depending on the kind of experience that you want to have and also obviously the kind of money that you want to spend. You can do that family style dinner um, at places like Liberty Tree Tavern. Another couple of places I really like and I recommend would be Whispering Canyon Cafe. It's a little bit more casual, a lot more fun, um, especially if you come from me, the big loud family. That's the perfect place for you is Whispering Canyon Cafe over at Wilderness Lodge. The Garden Grill over in Future World inside a theme park is another great option. And Ohana means family, so you want to try something different and still have that family style, all you can eat dinner. Those dinners will all range you about $25 to $33 per person for adults and about $12 to $15 per kid. You can also do specific Thanksgiving dinner offerings at other restaurants at places like, and this is this is the one in this list that I'd put first, is Artist Point over at Wilderness Lodge. Uh, arguably one of my favorite restaurants. You get that feeling of the Pacific Northwest. They do have the traditional turkey dinner with squash and candied pecans and field green. That's a uh, price fix meal that's served from 4 to 9.30 p.m. That ranges between $36 and $60.00. Also, California Grill, where I've recently spent six hours eating with somebody, uh, they also do a special Thanksgiving evening meal. They do have, again, the ham, the turkey, the cornbread, pumpkin creme brulee. Pumpkin creme brulee. A little bit pricier. You're looking around $63. But again, Sarah, that's what I mean. There's different levels of the experience that you can get. Sure. And I'll tell you, one of my favorite places um, here on property is actually at the Boardwalk at ESPN Zone. I am a huge football fan. So regardless of if I'm eating turkey or pizza or burgers or whatever on Thanksgiving, my family and I, we're watching football. And uh, it's it's a really fun experience at ESPN Club to be able to just have the excitement of all the fans that are there to watch the game too. So I'm so happy you said that because I, I actually had it written down in my notes and I said, I will be crucified if I say ESPN Zone for ESPN Club for Thanksgiving. But you're right, because a big part of Thanksgiving for many people, myself included, are the football games. And if you want to have that sort of casual fun, if you're going with friends or with family or or if your kids too, it's a really fun time. Again, you can make your Thanksgiving meal whatever you want it to be. And instead of turkey legs, if you want to have chicken wings, you can do that as well. So cool. I like you even more, Sarah Moore. Thanks, Lou. (laughs) Um, Some other places that I think you should think about, too. And again, I started thinking about the theme park experience. Uh, 50s Primetime Cafe. Again, there's that you feel like you're home if your home was in 1952. But you get that comfort food. You get that familial experience. And again, it's almost that sort of dining experience slash show that you get alongside as well. Some other places that you might not think about, but you should for a Thanksgiving dinner. And again, there are special menus specifically for Thanksgiving here. Again, all a la carte. Boat Rights, one of my favorites over at Port Orleans. Kona Cafe at the Polynesian. Le Cellier in World Showcase. Again, another nice, quiet, intimate uh, sit-down. Rose and Crown over at Epcot's World Showcase. And I know it's England, but that's okay. Just work with me here because, again, there's lots of options. 
Brown Derby over at uh, Disney's Hollywood Studios. They have a Thanksgiving menu. They also have the regular menu as well. So if you're like, hey, you know what, turkey's not my thing. I want to order off the regular menu. You can do that as well. We actually had a very enjoyable meal. It wasn't Thanksgiving, but it was it was just after Thanksgiving. The Osborne lights were up, and we really enjoyed a nice dinner there at the Derby before going to enjoy the lights together as a family. Yeah, other places too. Again, if you want to, you know, part of doing this and what we're going to talk about is maybe creating some of these new traditions, or maybe the tradition is trying something new every year. Maybe you don't want to have the traditional Thanksgiving turkey all the time. So you know what? Go to Jico. Go to Jico over in Animal Kingdom. Go to the Polynesian Luau. You want something really different, really fun. Better yet, go to the Hoop de Doo Review for Thanksgiving. And you let listen, if you could say ESPN Zone, I can certainly say the Hoop de Doo Review. Trails on Buffeteria, if you're on a budget, that's a great option. That's a it's a wonderful thing. And again, you sort of get that that home style cooking type of experience. And again, I could talk about food and Thanksgiving forever, but it's such a staple of Thanksgiving. One other that I wanted to throw out, an option you might not think of, is over at the Swan and Dolphin and some of the other hotels. Definitely look around, and I'll put a list uh, in the show notes of some of the other places that you can dine. And maybe, again, if you want the Thanksgiving turkey, it's there. If you want to try something a little bit different, a little bit sort of um, off the, the traditional menu, again, something like Chico might be something you want to try. But you can all, listen, despite what people think about me, you can only eat so much. And if you're going to be down here in Walt Disney World, let's talk about some of the things that you can do. Because I think that's what people don't think. They say, well, there is no Thanksgiving Day parade. There is no Thanksgiving Day event. But it's such a great time of year because of some of the special events that are going on. What are some of the things that you like about this time of year and things that people can experience? Well just surrounding this area right now um, because we don't have natural snow that falls um, still trying to get into the spirit of that obviously that happens at at the studios but um, in celebration just down the road um, there it snows nightly starting around Thanksgiving time um, yet you still have the beautiful weather, <laughs> so you're not sitting there freezing, but you've got the snow, you've got the ambiance, you've got that Christmas magic that's still already in the air. Certainly, and this is, you know, people say, wow, Christmas starts so early at Walt Disney World, literally like the day after Halloween is over, it's Christmas time. But that's actually a benefit, because if you are going to come down here for Thanksgiving, you can take advantage of the fact that the holidays are such a completely different experience here. You get all the decorations in the parks. You get the candlelight processional. You get Mickey's very Christ- merry Christmas party. So if you do want it to snow, if you want to have hot cocoa as you're waiting on a very short line, by the way, for Pirates or the newly refurbished Space Mountain, whatever it might be, you can do that as well because the Christmas season is in full force even before Thanksgiving rolls around. But at the same time, you've still got the weather to go back after the parks and jump in the pool. Absolutely. We're here in downtown Disney. You already start seeing the transformation taking place for the Festival of the Seasons. If you come early enough, Festival of the Masters is actually here a couple of weekends before Thanksgiving. But if you're going to take an extended family vacation, start before the Thanksgiving holiday. You can participate in that. Obviously, you mentioned also the Osborne Family Spectacle of Lights. You can and you absolutely should go resort hopping through all the different resorts, especially the ones on the monorail loop. Make a special trip out to Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge. Uh, Wilderness Lodge is absolutely spectacularly de- decorated for the holidays. And you want to sort of bring that, you know, even if it's hot outside, there's something about sitting in front of that fireplace and, and the way it's decorated and the way it just looks and smells in that lobby that's just wonderful and brings that sort of festive holiday spirit to you. Without a doubt. I mean, that's it's beautiful year-round, but there's, like you said, something about that time of year. It brings that sense of... Um, that sense of the season, that sense of holiday to you. Okay, I had another idea. I'm going back to food again. Make it a, a tradition to come down with your family every year and eat in a different country in World Showcase and see how they, well, not that they celebrate Thanksgiving, but sort of how it would almost translate to, I'm just looking at an excuse to try different <laughs> restaurants every time they come down. I know they don't celebrate Thanksgiving in Mexico or Norway, but that's okay. You celebrate it. Uh, you celebrate it there as well. Uh, 
But again, I think for a lot of people, Sarah, it throws them off because for them, and look, I came from that very traditional, you know, big Italian family, all 300 of us gather around the dining room table and we eat for five hours, watch some football, take a nap, and then eat for six hours again. What I think people don't realize is that there are a lot of different ways to bring that experience down here. And if sitting around the big dining room table, maybe not in a dining room that's filled with other families or other kids or in a theme park or even here in downtown Disney, you can do it. And uh, there's a lot of different ways you can. Certainly, Disney Vacation Club with the villas and some of the larger villas there is definitely one option that people can look into. Uh, there's so many options, obviously, surrounding Disney and on Disney property between hotels and suites and DVC and what I'm most familiar with is the vacation homes. <laughs> well, and two, now, and I've stayed at the vacation homes a number of times, and again, I go back to my big Italian family, sometimes it wouldn't be conducive to have 19 of us in a DVC property because there are so many and people want to sort of go off and do their different things and there's multi-generation so there's the young kids or babies that have to go into another room and take a nap that's where something like a vacation home would come into play but I like the idea and part, part of what sparked the idea of doing this segment was many of the houses like the one that I recently stayed at has the big dining room and the big dining room table and you can have that familial at home traditional experience like you get wherever you're from in the country right there and I think what people don't realize is that listen your mom your wife you your daughter whoever it is that you want to make do the cooking duties they're on vacation too they don't have to do the cooking to have that traditional dinner feast as we like to call it because there are options for that as well so if somebody is staying either at a DVC resort or a vacation home what kind of options are available there if a family chooses not to go out for Thanksgiving dinner, um, you can we can help to arrange to bring in a private chef or catering to bring in the full Thanksgiving dinner. Um, there's also a lot of restaurants that will prepare fully cooked meals with the turkey and the sides and the desserts and everything ready to go that can either be delivered or picked up to be brought to your home. Um, if you decide that you want to cook your family Thanksgiving dinner, um, the homes all come fully equipped with the um, utensils and the appliances and everything that you would need in order to make that yourself. Um, even if it's not the whole meal, maybe it's just one special dish or a special dessert that you want to do. Um, and then you still have leftover turkey. <laughs> you can still do turkey sandwiches, and you've got the opportunity then to relax there at the home and and still in, be in the center of it all, um, but have that, that comfortable home where everyone's under one roof and can relax as a family and truly come together for the holiday. And that's really, all right, Believe it or not, it's not all about the food. It is all about the experience. And I thought about that. And I said, well, how would I convince my parents to come down here and stay at a hotel? And they just, that wouldn't necessarily be Thanksgiving maybe for them. But if I said, look, all of us can come down, stay in one big house like we used to do years ago. Everybody has their own room. There's the big TV. We can watch football. People can lounge around. There's a pool outside. There's a spa outside. You can do all those different things and not sort of feel like you're in the hustle and bustle of the theme park. Because look, some of the options that I gave you, especially about things like dining, are great. But if you want to dine on Thanksgiving, a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, you need to plan your ADRs as far in advance as possible because it is going to be, they are going to go fast. And number two, the parks are going to be very, very crowded on Thanksgiving Day. It is a, a traditionally somewhat less crowded time of year, especially the week following Thanksgiving getting into uh, December, but Thanksgiving itself will be crowded, and maybe you don't want to eat in a restaurant and feel rushed and hurried, and you want to sort of just graze like we do for six, seven hours at a time, and leave everything out on the dining room table, and let people sort of eat at their leisure and nap, but if you want to watch football, you want to play pool in the game room, or just sort of hang out, relax, whatever, that's where the advantage comes, and that's why I started thinking about doing this as a segment, to sort of introduce people to what for them might be a somewhat radical concept. 
It is, but everyone also can have their own space. So many of the homes have multiple master suites, so you can have a five-bedroom house with five bathrooms, and everyone has their own space. Um, in addition to the, the dining room and then the seating for the table there, you've also got outside seating, so it's a beautiful day. You can sit around the pool deck, your own private pool deck, and just enjoy that space there, and everyone has a little bit more room to come and go, yet you're all still together. And you have the advantage of this in your backyard because the homes are very close, you know, within a couple of miles, a few minute drive of Walt Disney World. So whether it's later on that night or the next morning, you want to get up and go to Main Street and see the Christmas decorations or you want to come shopping in downtown Disney or, hey, let's take the whole family up on characters in flight. Let's go see Lanuba. Let's go do something special like that and start these new sort of family traditions It's a great way slash great excuse to get everybody together on a family vacation and and bring it around that central holiday. Absolutely. Or one of my favorites is illuminations, especially around the holidays. And to be able to come to Epcot um, even just at night after after a nice Thanksgiving dinner and you've had that chance to relax. Yeah. And again, you know, there's a whole other segment of nightlife. And again, if if the kids want to stay at the home and some of the parents want to go out, and go to Victoria Falls over at Animal Kingdom and have a drink or whatever, they can do that as well without having to worry about, you know, who's in what room where. Yeah, I think there's a lot of advantages and reasons why, reasons, excuses, whatever it is, to convince maybe your spouse or your parents or your kids or whatever it is about doing something like this and coming down here. I think the combination of the dining options and the entertainment options and what things like, for example, a vacation home would give you as far as that feeling of tradition, that feeling of being at home, you get that there. I think people should hopefully in the start thinking about the future, maybe next year, coming down and trying Thanksgiving in Walt Disney World. I'm going to put in the show notes uh, links to obviously all-star vacation homes. I'll also put a list of some of the restaurants that you should look at Uh, if you are considering maybe coming down and and again sort of expanding the idea of what that traditional Thanksgiving day and Thanksgiving meal might be. Again, planning ahead is key because Thanksgiving is uh, a a very busy time of year and that's why we wanted to do it sort of around this time of year but giving you thoughts to put in your mind for next year. So Sarah Moore from allstarvacationhomes.com thank you as always for joining me. It's been a pleasure Lou and hope to see everyone around the holidays. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thanks go to my guests, Dave Barry and Ridley Pearson. I'll put links in the show notes this week at wdwradio.com where you can purchase the Peter and the Star Catchers books directly and follow them on places like Twitter. Also want to say thanks to Sarah Moore from All Star Vacation Homes. I'll put a link also in the show notes where you can find out more and get a link for special discounts and offers available only for WDW Radio listeners. Don't forget, the next meet of the month in Walt Disney World is going to be Friday, December 11th. I don't have an exact time and location as yet, but definitely stay tuned to the, to the show, Facebook, Twitter, and the forums for the exact details in the next week or so. Don't forget, too, that on Saturday, there's going to be the NFFC Club for Disney and Enthusiasts All Disney Show and Sale at the Regal Sun Resort in downtown Disney. It opens to the public at 10 a.m., ends at 4 p.m. I will be there. Tim Foster will be there. Other authors, podcasters, so many more vendors and dealers will be there. Admission at the door is only $5. For more information, visit nffc.org. Remember, parking is free, and the Regal Sun Resort is right there in downtown Disney. So if you want to get a bus to downtown Disney, you could just walk on over to the Regal Sun. Speaking of Tim Foster and Celebrations Magazine, we're also going to be having our very first Celebrations meet. That's going to be Sunday, December 13th, in France, in Epcot's World Showcase. 
That will be at 2 p.m. Again, I'll put links to that as well as the meat of the month in this week's show notes and the forums. For more information to subscribe or order back issues to Celebrations Magazine, you can go and visit celebrationspress.com. I'll also link in the show notes this week where you can join the Celebrations Magazine fan page on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Speaking of Twitter and Facebook, if you want to follow my instant updates on Twitter, you can head on over to twitter.com. My account is Lou Mangello. I'll link that up in the show notes. As well as coming by, friend me up over on Facebook and join the WDW Radio Show fan page. And if you're on Twitter and if you like the show, go ahead, tweet out that you're listening to the show, recommend it to others, and link to WDWRadio.com in your tweets. A couple of other quick reminders. Don't forget that if you're interested in cruising with us on the Disney Cruise Line's newest ship, The Disney Dream, on February 27th, 2011, go visit WDWRadioCruise.com. There you can find out more information, get photos, ride-throughs, videos, so much more, as well as the booking form. And if you're thinking about coming and still maybe on the fence, I highly recommend that you think about booking now. Remember, you can get a full refund up to about 120 days out of the sailing, so you're looking about a year's time to really have to make a final decision. I do know the ship is filling up. Categories are beginning to sell out. So again, if you are if interested, want some more information, visit www.radiocruise.com. Don't forget that if you have any questions you want answered on the show, email me at lou at www.radio.com. Or if you want to be heard on the air, you can call the toll-free voicemail line at 888-703-2171. And if you want to be part of the show, you want to help volunteer your time and talent and be part of the WDW Radio team, I'll put a link in the show notes again this week to a form on the site that you could submit. It has information about specifically the roles that we're looking to fill. Again, any and all help is greatly appreciated. Stay tuned for the next WDW Radio live chat coming very soon. That's the real interactive video broadcast and chat. We're working on something real special for an upcoming episode. So again, Facebook, Twitter, the forums, best way to find out about that. Thanks, as always, to my partners and sponsors, including All-Star Vacation Home, Becky and her team over at Mouse Fan Travel, and Chantel and her team over at DVCbyResale.com. And as always, my friends, if you like the show, I'm going to ask you to not only please help spread the word, let others know about it, but please head on over to PodcastAwards.com. The show has been nominated for Best Travel Podcast for 2009. You can go to PodcastAwards.com. In the travel category at the bottom right, you can vote for WDW Radio every day up until November 30th. You can remember voting once per day really helps. You must use a valid email address because they will send you an email to confirm your vote. It will not count unless you click on that link. Also, please go ahead and cast your vote for Clinton at the comedy forecast over in the comedy category as well. Again, I really, really appreciate all of the help and support and Again, thank you so much just for taking the time and tuning in this and every week. I really do appreciate it. So until next time, remember, always keep moving forward, follow your dreams, and have a great, great week, everybody. See ya. Hey, Lou, it's Mike in uh, Kennesaw, Georgia, and just got finished watching that video of the things in the Magic Kingdom that make you smile. Ah, it was incredible. Um, This makes me more eager for my next trip to the world, so uh, keep up the good work. Look forward to hearing the uh, podcast each week. Thanks. Hi, Lou. This is um, Brian uh, from Philadelphia, Doc B on the forum. And um, we just got back uh, from a trip to Walt Disney World. And uh, a cool little tip for uh, listeners there on uh, a really neat little keepsake uh, that you can get. And it really costs nothing at all is uh, when you go on uh, Spaceship Earth, uh, after you reach the uh, top of the attraction, uh, see where you see the Earth, the planetarium-like setting, uh, on the descent back down uh, to Earth, um, as the ride is ending, uh, and not to give away too much, there is an interactive portion uh, that uses uh, images of you taken at the um, beginning of the attraction, uh, photographs that they uh, manipulate them and create some fun stuff. And... uh, you know, when listeners uh, get to the end of the attraction, uh, you should definitely be sure to 
and take advantage of the part where you can use those images and even a little video and uh, send emails to people you know or to yourself. And then when you get back home, um, you, can, you can retrieve those images and the video that they create uh, in its entirety, which you can download uh, onto your computer and you know, burn onto a DVD and uh, watch nothing at all. And you know, what a great little uh, you know, free uh, keepsake uh, of the trip. Um, we had a great time. Uh, you know, we went through the ride a couple times. We didn't know that until it happened, and when we got home and saw the email, saw that we got to see uh, you know, the photo and, and, and the video link, uh, which you can download. Um, that was a neat little surprise, and uh, you know, downloaded it and put it on a DVD, and uh, a nice free little souvenir of uh, Spaceship Earth. So, uh, hope this helps some people, and uh, keep up the good work, Lou. Uh, love your show, and uh, learning a lot from it. Thanks a lot. Hi, Lou. This is Alicia. I'm Iggy AA on the forum and in the box. I wanted to say I really enjoyed the show about 1973. Um, I was one year old then, and I have seen pictures of me being p- pushed around Disney World um, one, when I was uh, one in 1973 with a, a group of adults. I think I was the excuse for all those adults to go finally check out Disney World. And it was really neat to be able to try and visualize what it looked like when I was there and to try and think that maybe I actually remembered it, which I'm sure I don't. Um, And anyhow, I really enjoyed it, and I look forward to hearing future shows. Thanks a lot. Bye.